On a January morning, it is just dawn when Santa Fe number 212 slips out of Tulsa, Oklahoma, as quietly as steel on steel can move. At eight miles an hour through the heart of the city, which has only begun to awaken. <laughs> It does not leave from the station. The station has been closed for several years. It leaves from the freight depot where a freight agent finds time to sell all the tickets required. There is no need for a train station in Tulsa. Today, this city of a quarter million is served by only two passenger trains, the Oil Flyer and this one, the Tulsa. But now even they are threatened. The oil flyer, the most sure to go, and then, very likely, the Tulson. Santa Fe 211 to 12, serving 24 towns between here and Kansas City. And when it leaves, it will leave the depot empty in almost every one of them. The last train from Tulsa, Oklahoma, and the last train from Cherryvale, Kansas. and public affairs departments of KCMO Broadcasting present the last train from Cherryvale. <laughs> Reporting is Wendell Anschutz. There are 120 seats on the Tulsa, counting everyone who boards into trains along its 260-mile route to Kansas City. There will be half that number of passengers. Among them, Ray Francis, editor and publisher of the Cherryvale Republican, also linotype operator, salesman, and reporter. Uh, we have an airport just five miles from town, and I also have a car that uh, I could drive, but I prefer not to on account of traffic. I would rather go on the train and up and back. And it's a lot more convenient than driving. You don't have to worry about parking. Well, some young ones fly out of here, but uh, the old people prefer the train. The ones who always rode the rails and always will. The ones who remember the era, the era of the singing rails and the rumbling cars and the mighty engines roar. The ones who went on riding while other sounds began seeking their attention and continued to ride, even when those sounds had swelled to shattering intensity. those slow evolutions that didn't draw much attention to itself while it was happening. But then, one day, it had happened. The railroads were last in line. For every passenger who rode the rails, five were riding the airlines. For every two who rode the train, three were riding the bus. As the machinery of free enterprise is healthy competition, the product often is progress. And the progress transforming the transportation industry had resulted in almost no competition at all. Air travel was accelerating at the rate of a 707. New airports springing up all over the country, preparing for more planes, bigger planes, faster planes. 
But you never read about the opening of a new Union Station or a new stretch of track or a new railroad, only about the merger of the old ones. <laughs> And the railroads, which once introduced smartly dressed hostesses to counter the stewardess, now have acknowledged the facts. That a 727, for example, can fly from Chicago to Denver for $1,600 less than the Vista Dome California Zephyr and make for its airline $950, while the Zephyr goes in the red by an average of $350. And after citing those harsh statistics, William J. Quinn, president of the Burlington Lines, conceded that air travel is one of the more dramatic changes to take place in transportation, if not in the history of civilized man. But a greater testimonial to the change which has overwhelmed the 20th century is down there, streaming along the city streets and racing across the country on $42 billion worth of interstate highways that will stretch 41,000 miles when the program's completed. Today, the interstate system is only about half completed, but already it has revolutionized American transportation. That same Commerce Department study, which shows airlines doing five times the business of railroads, shows the family car carrying nine times the intercity travelers of all commercial transportation combined. When the first passenger train went into service, the automobile didn't even exist. Today, it is a necessity because of a healthy economy, which the auto industry itself helped create. It has become possible for almost everyone to own a car. The only problem is that almost everyone does. Again, the president of Burlington concedes that the ownership of automobiles has greatly expanded personal achievement and enjoyment. He also concedes it has produced monumental traffic jams all over the country, and it has helped to knock the props from under the railroad passenger business. Across the flat Kansas farmlands, number 212 still holds its own against anything else that moves on land. It's still 90 miles an hour between cities. And even the stops are short nowadays, only whistle stops of two or three minutes. Enough for conductor L.E. Olson to detrain and board his passengers and pick up his train orders advising of what to watch for on the track ahead. Number 212 is running on time this morning, 33 minutes between Cherryvale and Chinute. This was the longest stop of the trip, 10 minutes to board the new head-end crew. It was also the setting, January 10th, for a round of Interstate Commerce Commission hearings on a request by Santa Fe to discontinue the Tulson and the Oil Flyer. Ellie Olson has been with the railroad since 1929. Now, for the first time in all those years, something is missing, the railway post office car. That's why the hearings were held. To the railroad industry, the announcement of September 6th, 1967, was the five-cent letter that broke the passenger trains back. On January 12th, the phase-out was completed. 
And in the Kansas City Terminal Railway yards, a lone workman set about dismantling the fixtures of the last combination RPO and baggage car to come off the Kansas City Southern lines. The end of phase one in the government plan to cut costs and improve mail service. The post office is establishing a system, including air transportation of first-class mail, which it says makes sorting on the train unnecessary. Even with the giant strides and other forms of transportation, the railroads had managed to maintain a marginal passenger operation, usually at a slight loss. But now the backbone of their passenger revenue was broken. The railroads would continue to carry mail, but now nearly all of it would go by freight, and there would be no more sorting en route. The RPO car had gone the way of the steam engine in only four months. If there were an earth tremor at 1020 this morning, the people of Welda, Kansas, wouldn't know it. When number 212 comes racing through, the whole town shakes. This morning, the Tulson is running on time, just like the old days. And somehow, there's a little irony in that, at a moment when its future looks so hopeless. The fact is that the very mail car, which once provided 212's lifeblood, also had become the stone around its neck. If trains didn't carry mail, they didn't make money. So they'd wait in every station as long as it took to load it on board. On time or not, a train without a mail car means a delay for Ray Francis. Yesterday in Cherryvale, Francis was taking care of his last item of business before leaving for Kansas City. He was putting his newspaper to bed for the week. Rap City is just 25 miles west. They have a nice little weekly newspaper over there. He mails his papers the same time I do on Wednesday afternoons. I get done with his paper until Saturday. And I used to get it the next morning. And over on the west, uh, around the sedan over there, the uh, newspaper publisher over there, uh, Sam Shade told me that it took two days to get a letter from Sedan to Moline, only 20 miles away. Cherryvale was once a town of 5,500. But in the last quarter century, the population has dwindled to little more than half that size. And to Francis, the impending end of the passenger service here is just another step in the strangulation of the small town. It's about this part of the journey when Claude Ferguson makes his rounds. He's been with the railroad for 25 years, a waiter in charge for 17. During that period, he says, he's noticed the change. But there was a time when uh, we had the Irish linen, silverware. It has been just gradually cut back, cut back, cut back. I mean, the silver, the linen has been taken off. The silverware has been taken off. The menu has been changed, and uh, we used to have three and four course dinners. Now I've seen many everybody's in a hurry, and they just bring it out and set it out. They, they don't take time. Everybody's in a hurry. After the war, during that period when the airlines began creeping ahead of the rail passenger service, the rail lines waged a vigorous campaign to win their passengers back. But the public continued gradually to turn away. Ferguson has watched it happen. Well, well, I think a few years ago, somewhere way back here, they stuck into the dictionary the word progress. Now, progress has always hurt some people, but I think in the long run, the masses, you know, benefit from it. And uh, it just so happened now that the railroad men are the ones that's going to be hurt. And uh, all those that can't uh, stick it out or don't have enough for time to retire, I mean, they'll just have to go into some under the industry. I mean, it, it's, it has happened before. It has always happened. 
Until now, the trains had been going off the line one by one and silently. Now the railroads replied to the post office notice of September with a flood of discontinuance requests. Several Santa Fe trains came off the line in Kansas City. Burlington was asking for hearings on trains 35 and 36 between Kansas City and Chicago. Union Pacific was seeking to end the run of its famed Portland Rose. Norfolk and Western was asking to drop two trains between Kansas City and St. Louis. And Kansas City Southern was requesting the end of all its passenger service, including the tradition-bound Southern Bell. The Frisco Railway does not have to wait for a hearing. Its last train rolled into Union Station in December. Even Superintendent Bill Apple wouldn't pretend that Union Station was not suffering. More than 200 trains a day rolled in and out of Kansas City's new showpiece when it opened with a two-day celebration in 1914. Today, there are 66, but railroad men underlined one point so hard it would break the point off a railroad spike. Even if every request for a discontinuance is granted this year, which is not likely, the railroad passenger service is not dead. Even if the number of arrivals and departures is halved again, Union Station plans to stay in business. And not as a shopping center or a railroad museum, but as it started in 1914, as Union Station. Just last year, the Kansas City Terminal Railway, which operates the station yards, spent thousands of dollars for a giant train wash. It constantly replaces its switch engines with the latest available. And the same is true of the entire rail passenger industry. For most of the railroads, the trend is toward fewer trains, but finer trains. Trains which will handle all the demands the reduced number of passengers will place upon them. Trains with smooth riding, high level cars, plushly carpeted sky domes at no extra fare, relaxing club cars, and spacious diners. 24 18, you can go on that board in case there's more dragon on the line. More irony. In the wave of pessimism pouring down on railroad passenger service came a report from the ICC at the end of the year that 1967 had been the best year for the railroads in the last 11. Railroad men always have maintained that no freight hauler will ever replace flanged wheels on steel rails. The rails still carry nearly half of everything shipped. They're keeping pace with the rest of the shipping industry, and it's because, in this case, they found ways of keeping pace with the times. Frisco and Santa Fe, for instance, weren't satisfied with the railroad's 8% share of the auto hauling market, so they developed the tri-level car, and in only seven years had brought the railroad's share to 38%. Single trains have hauled over 2,000 automobiles, single cargoes valued at over $7 million. If the trucking industry was cutting in on their profits, the railroads could meet that problem too. They'd buy their own trucks and replace 50 drivers with one train crew, then drive the loaded trailers off on short haul routes when they reached their destination. New electronic equipment made it possible to trace a car through every mile of its journey from coast to coast. The railroads have witnessed the successful marriage of the computer and the boxcar. The Santa Fe tracks follow a curious course through Ottawa, right down the middle of the street through the heart of town past the rows of white frame houses over the river, past the old steam engine sidetracked forever by the station. Alfred Bowman remembers the old coal burners. He's put in as much time on steam engines as he has on diesels. He started with the railroad in 1922 and recalls the day when he shoveled 29 tons of coal between Tulsa and Chanute. He's been engineering, running as he puts it, for most of his career. And though the diesel was a revolution in comfort, he found it hard to leave the steam engine. It's smoother riding on uh, 
you just kind of hated to give it up. It seemed like the diesel was awkward. Although, uh, I'd been on a diesel for about a year, and I put me on a steam engine, and the next day I couldn't hardly move. I was so sore. There are some sounds so common and yet so distinctive, they seem to echo on into infinity. On a crystal January morning, the distant moans of old 99 would cut through the crisp winter cold across the prairie. So common, you really didn't hear them. So common, you can hear them still. Old 99 and all those like her are gone forever. The last of the great iron horses. Some of them, a very few, turned out to pasture, to museums and city parks, to those great collectors of the ingenious gadgetry which time has branded useless. Steam engine, you could always just get a little bit more if you had to have it. And a diesel, when you open them up, that's all. You can't get any more. Uh, you could take a hill, you could make a little run for it, tell the fireman to get her real hot, and it just seemed like you could get it. If you had to have just a little more, you always could get just a little more. There are some sounds so common, yet so distinctive, they seem to echo on into infinity. Sounds that are only the wind. Al Bowman didn't like to see the new diesels arrive. They represented change. But today, he sways in the saddle of the cab like a man in his favorite rocker. And if there's another change, Al Bowman soon will be rocking again. Whether it's coal dust or diesel fuel or chair cars or box cars, it's all the railroad. And so the train pulls out of Olathe, last stop of the trip, toward a destination which one uncertain day will become its last. But today it is Santa Fe 212, regularly scheduled passenger service between Tulsa, Oklahoma and Kansas City Union Station. And today, it's running on time.
is to blame for the decline in passenger service? Was it the railroads because they abandoned the public, or the public because it abandoned the railroad? Or was it the clock the railroaders kept so religiously, which acknowledged the industry's precision at each trip's end and kept on ticking as it did? train from Cherryvale, a special community service presentation produced by the News and Public Affairs Departments of Casey Amo Broadcasting in Kansas City, a division of the Meredith Corporation. <laughs>